Thank you. The opportunity to share with you our experience in managing a COVID surge in a global hotspot, New York City. I'm chair of radiology at Monica Medical Center, which is located in the Bronx in New York City. And as you can see, our first cases came to our largest hospital in early March. And within four weeks, this rapidly escalated to about 2,000 cases. And I'm glad to say that as of two days ago, we are currently on the other side of the curve and we currently have about 400 cases. This is the website for the um, Hopkins COVID tracker map that I think you may find useful. And uh, it can be used to track any country. Um, you can see globally, currently, there are over 5 million COVID positive cases that have been confirmed um, with about 1.5 million located in the United States. When you look at deaths globally, there are about 330,000 deaths due to COVID. And of those deaths, about a third are in the United States. And within the United States, about a third of the deaths are actually in New York State. And when you look at the map of the US, you can see the yellow arrow points to a clear uh, hotspot uh, centered around uh, New York. Now, uh, New York City is located in the southeastern uh, portion of New York State. Where I'm located, the Bronx, it is north of Manhattan and Queens. Um, there are five boroughs. And the Bronx uh, is home to about one and a half million residents. It's very special because we do have a large Hispanic and African American population. Uh, we serve the underserved, so our patients typically have a high burden of chronic disease, such as hypertension, diabetes, and asthma. And as we all know, uh, these are comorbidities that increase the risk for the development of COVID. Additionally, crowding is an issue, and this makes social distancing difficult. These two graphs demonstrate the infection rate and the mortality rate by borough in New York City. And you can see that the blue arrow uh, points to where the Bronx is. And basically, the Bronx has the highest COVID infection rate and the mortality rate of all of the boroughs. I think that everyone has noted that there are racial disparities um, in COVID positive cases. And it's not just in New York City, it's really globally. Um, and this uh, graph shows you that uh, when you look at the case rates for community cases in the hospital and mortality rates, that Blacks and Hispanics by far have the highest rates. What are some of the lessons that we've learned from this pandemic um, that we are currently still undergoing? Is that you really need to institute aggressive measures early on. You need to quarantine symptomatic individuals and to perform aggressive contact tracing. And in fact, when I showed you in the first slide um, the early uh, in-hospital admissions, this was related to uh, some of our faculty who were quarantined, and a cluster that occurred in New Rochelle, which was just north of where we're located. Now, back then, we did not have adequate PCR testing. So if an individual were exposed to a COVID-positive person, they had to quarantine for 14 days. And uh, currently, we've decreased that down to seven days. You also need to strictly enforce social distancing strategies and hygiene and universal masking. We have fortunately developed adequate PCR testing currently, um, and we have two strategies, both on-site and off-site testing. On-site is preferable because the results come back more rapidly within hours now, um, but we also have off-site testing. Uh, that typically takes two to five days because the samples are mailed uh, out. Um, another strategy that I think is particularly important is to develop a radiology-specific COVID response team. And this should include your uh, radiologist leaders, so physicians, administrators, nurses, PAs, your technologists, and definitely um, your IT team. 
I think this really helps you to more efficiently um, and quickly deal with uh, COVID-related issues at all of your different sites. There are also site considerations, and we paralleled our efforts um, relative to our clinical colleagues. So as our elective surgeries and procedures were canceled and deferred to a later date, um, we found that there was not as much need for outpatient imaging, so we closed some of our outpatient sites. More importantly, with the um, overwhelming number of inpatients that we were getting, we had to rapidly expand the number of beds. And that included both ICU beds, as well as inpatient medicine beds, as well as emergency room beds. And in fact, uh, our children's hospital was converted into an adult COVID hospital. Concurrently, you need to increase your stock of ventilators and then the medications that are used for ventilated patients. Now, how does this affect radiology specifically? Well, we needed, uh, very quickly we realized additional portable x-ray units. We just did not have enough on hand for all of our different sites and for the large number of inpatients. We were fortunate in having close uh, partnerships with vendors who uh, were able to provide us with demo and trial units uh, at no cost to our hospital. We also initially designated specific CT scanners for COVID positive patients. Um, but again, because we had so many uh, infected patients, it wound up that all of our CT scanners and all of our imaging equipment we had to treat as if it were for COVID positive patients. Um, and, and that's what we wound up evolving to. Ultrasound cases are special because uh, the technologists uh, spend quite a bit of time up close to patients. Uh, and we had a lot of infected patients, so we asked that a physician triage all ultrasound cases, meaning that they would decide whether the case was even indicated to be performed. And if indicated, they would um, make sure that we decrease the number of images that were needed so that we only needed to, in, to uh, answer the diagnostic uh, question. And this slide just shows you how we were able to, uh, within uh, four weeks transform our grand hall into a COVID ward. Um, and you can recognize the pillar, um, but pretty much everything else was converted. Um, the flooring was changed and uh, COVID patients were quickly able to uh, come into this ward. Now, I did want to spend a little time going over with you the American College of Radiology recommendations for imaging of COVID patients. And um, basically, the recommendations state that CT should not be used to screen for or as a first-line test to diagnose COVID. If, however, you're in an area where there are constrained resources, um, where you have limited availability of COVID testing, for example, some practices are uh, requesting and using chest CT to help make decisions. Portable chest x-ray should be used only when medically necessary. The CDC parallels the ACR recommendations, does not currently recommend chest x-ray or CT to diagnose COVID. Below you see the chest x-rays of an unfortunate 27-year-old woman in our hospital who had no significant past medical history. You can see came in, was intubated, has bilateral pneumonias, um, and did not do well. I also wanted to bring to your attention the uh, new uh, Fleischer Society consensus statement uh, that has subsequently been developed. Um, and uh, these uh, guidelines state that imaging is not routinely indicated as a screening test for COVID in asymptomatic patients and is also not indicated for patients who have mild features of COVID unless there's a risk for disease progression. However, imaging is indicated for patients with moderate to severe features of COVID, irrespective of the test results for COVID, and it is indicated for um, COVID patients who have an evidence of uh, clinically worsening respiratory status. An additional lesson learned is that you do need to stockpile PPE. And this is the list of the typical PPE that is needed. Um, we went on to Amazon, for example, even to purchase goggles, which were still available. Surgical masks are typically not an issue. Um, gowns and gloves and disinfectant wipes we didn't have an issue with initially. What we did have an issue with um, 
for the N95 masks and the face shields. Um, and we're fortunate in that our health system uh, rapidly was able to um, develop supplies of N95 masks in coordination with the other New York hospitals. Um, face shields, we were fortunate in that we had just opened up our 3D imaging lab with multiple 3D printers located in the lab. We started to print our own face shields. Uh, and we have since disseminated thousands of face shields to the entire health system. Now, one strategy we also used is that you'll find within the pandemic, your research labs are closed. And pretty much only employees coming in to take care of animal labs are allowed in. Um, for those labs that were closed, they were very generous and uh, lent us um, their PPE that, that they were not using. So we received PPE from them as well. And then obviously donations from other sources. I bring your attention um, to this paper that was published in JACR, which details a lot of um, what I discussed. We um, enforce that all patients uh, to and from radiology must be masked. And this is just an example in the lower left of the surgical mask um, and the N95. And typically N95s are used once and then disposed of. There is an option for extended use, which is what we're doing, where you can wear the N95 um, throughout the day. Um, you place a surgical mask over the N95 mask, and then if you're patient facing, you also put in um, a, a face shield. And uh, this has uh, worked very well in protecting our frontline uh, healthcare workers. And this is just an example of the thousands of face shields that we have printed uh, in our 3D imaging lab. We found also that there was a shortage of nasopharyngeal swabs uh, for PCR testing. Uh, so our 3D lab started to print uh, these swabs as well. Now another strategy we used um, is remote reading. And I think that this is something that uh, had, uh, many sites have uh, started to use, particularly during the pandemic, and it's been extremely helpful. We divided our radiologists into two teams. 30% uh, read remotely from home, and 70% uh, remained on site. Our interventional radiologists were the only ones who stayed on site, all of them. Our off-site faculty shifted their weekly coverage, so instead of Monday through Fridays, they were asked to cover Wednesdays through Sundays. We were fortunate in that about half of our faculty already had home workstations because our health system um, did not have the funding to provide to purchase new uh, workstations. For the radiologists who stayed on site, um, we practiced uh, strict social distancing and we only allowed one or two radiologists per reading room. We're fortunate in that we have multiple sites spread across the county. Um, so uh, many of the radiologists were able to have their own uh, room um, and that, that was very helpful. Resident education is critical to maintain during the pandemic. And so we allow residents to read from home or on site. They were paired with an attending based on the division that they were assigned to and were able to continue to look at clinical cases uh, actively and to continue to learn. We also instituted lectures and e-learning uh, successfully. There are personnel considerations also. And as we experienced a significant drop in our volumes to about 60 to 70 percent uh, within six weeks, we found that many of our uh, divisions did not have enough work. Interestingly, the only divisions where we had stable workload were chest and interventional radiology. And as our surgical colleagues um, deferred and canceled cases, uh, some of our um, IR cases uh, increased. Uh, so, for example, our interventional radiologists were putting in a lot more gastrostomies and uh, catheters. We did provide for our faculty who were not able to uh, come into work uh, because of various uh, reasons, medical reasons, for example, reasonable accommodation in FMLA. We also shifted vacation and academic time and front-loaded that so that when we do expect a surge of uh, increase in imaging volume later in the year, uh, we'll have more faculty on hand to help with that. And then as a health system requirement, um, we were asked to redeploy staff. And on the eligible list were our residents and fellows, our faculty, our PAs and nurses. About 50% of our residents wound up being deployed 
uh, two COVID wards. Um, and uh, I am extremely proud of how they handled themselves in multidisciplinary teams uh, and uh, uh, did very well. Uh, our faculty were eligible for deployment, but uh, as we uh, decreased in case volume, they were never asked to actually be actively deployed. We did deploy some of our nurses uh, and our PAs. I think staff support is uh, important um, throughout the pandemic, and our health system jumped in. They provided no cost hotel nights for the frontline staff who were worried about going home at nights and, and uh, infecting their family members. Um, they also provided, you can see, car rentals and hospital meals and scrubs. And then our medical students pitched in and, and helped provide uh, free child care. Staff well-being is also critical during the pandemic, but also after the pandemic. And uh, new support centers were developed. You can see motion support hotlines, expedited referrals to psychiatry, uh, clergy for spiritual support, and all of this uh, is continuing. Now we are um, on the other side of the curve, as I mentioned. We've developed our post-pandemic planning, or P3 task force, as I like to call it. And these are the specific areas of focus. We are developing what we call our designated care sites, where specific COVID-positive patients will go to specific sites. We're performing optimized scheduling. So we're not immediately going back to full schedules. We'll have fewer cases with rest times uh, between the cases so that we properly clean, disinfect the equipment. We are streamlining protocols uh, such as for MR uh, to decrease the length of exams. We are um, looking at social distancing with our uh, waiting rooms and reconfiguring seating uh, as well as making sure that we have proper uh, distancing markers and signage. Um, continuing education for infection control, specifically for radiology, is being developed, um, and we are performing strict inventory control of our PPP going forward. I think in trying to gain and regain um, the confidence of our patients and our referring physicians, uh, messaging and public relations is very important. So we're using text messaging, developing multilingual videos for our patients, um, and using social media uh, to reach out uh, to our patients and uh, referring physicians. Something that we started to use during the pandemic, and I think that will continue, particularly because it is reimbursed within the United States, is uh, use of telehealth consults, uh, specifically for interventional radiology and our interventional radiology. But perhaps it can be extended to other areas like lung cancer screening. Then finally, research is a big part of, of what we do. Um, and we have not opened up uh, on our Einstein campus uh, research labs as yet, but I expect that to happen uh, within the next uh, few weeks. So um, this uh, image just shows you how many patients we've actually had in our hospital. Um, this was a discharge of our 5,000 5, COVID positive patient uh, just about two weeks ago. Um, if we are to learn from history, specifically the 1918 influenza pandemic, uh, that came in three waves. And the second wave was actually much worse than the first wave. And I think that all of the lessons that we've learned, the best practices uh, that we have developed will certainly carry on um, or the expected next wave, and hopefully it won't be as bad um, as, as expected. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.